Hi everyone. Uh, so let me begin this session by introducing myself to those who might be joining uh, our session for the first time. This is Ashnut Kothari here. I'm a qualified actuary. Uh, I have been teaching for close to seven and a half years now. Along with that, I have around four to five years of corporate experience as well, working in investments uh, as well as, you know, property and casualty domain. So today's session has primarily been conducted uh, to, you know, talk uh, on CS2 paper A, which had come in IFOA September 2023 session. Uh, just like the past three attempts, I would say students in this session as well did find difficulty, uh, be it in paper A. Some of you did find difficulty in paper B as well. So the purpose of this session is to, you know, uh, go through each of the questions of CS2 paper A. Uh, I won't be going into the commenting part and all, but I'll focus on certain other areas, uh, you know, specifically, uh, specifically the numerical part, derivation part or anything else, you know, which I feel like uh, the ones who were preparing for CS2 should be aware of. Um, I really honestly haven't got much time to cross check my solutions. A couple of scripts which I checked uh, from the students, I mean, they had done something different altogether for a couple of questions. So in case, you know, you do find any sort of inconsistencies in the solution or any sort of calculation errors, uh, do let me know separately uh, on our WhatsApp, uh, you know, on my WhatsApp number or, you know, once we upload this video over YouTube, you could uh, post any sort of concerns you might have with respect to calculation error or any other uh, solutions to the comments section itself. So uh, before we get started, uh, let me just again let you all know that uh, you all have been put on mute. Uh, so in case you have any questions, feel free to ask to the chat box. Please keep in mind it's not a doubt session as per se. Uh, my focus is on, you know, to go through the questions and tell you all, you know, why uh, the ones who had prepared well should have been able to attend. If not all, most of the questions in case if there was any linking of any question to a similarly question asked in the past and so on. So let's get started finally uh, with the first question. I'll be reading it out quickly as well. Um, I have kept around three hours buffer for this particular session. Uh, it's the first time I'm doing something like that else usually I just record it separately with the solutions and all available. And obviously the ones uh, who are studying with us in case they have doubts, you know, they can obviously attend our uh, live classes or, you know, directly reach out to me or uh, through study group or through personal chat. So, uh, first question was, uh, regarding, uh, I will say survival methods, which is chapter six, if I correctly recall from CS2, I mean, the chapter numbers is something it keeps changing for different papers, but if I recall correctly in 2023, as well as 24 version also, I mean, this remains chapter six only survival models. So in the question, what they have given is a leap year is a calendar year, which has 366 days, including 29th February. This occurs once every four years and the most recent leap year was 2020. Now, again, some of you know who are into this or let's say who might be preparing for CAT or just through general knowledge would know that uh, in fact, every fourth year is not a leap year. In case it's a multiple of 100 as well, then that is not a leap year. So for example, uh, 2100, 2200, 2300, these, if I recall correctly, are not technically leap years. Uh, so, but again, you know, for the purpose of this question, we could ignore that. So now it's given that a group of people who were born on 29th February in different leap years meet for dinner once every four years when it is a leap year to celebrate their unusual birthdays. The number of people at the dinner on 29th Feb 2020 was recorded by the year of birth as follows. 1948, 3 attended. 1952, 8 attended. 1956, 18 attended. So ones who had the year of birth as 1948 on 2020, their age would have been nothing but 72. Ones whose year of birth was 1952, their age on 29th Feb 2020 will be nothing but 68. And for those born in 1956, their age will be nothing but 64. Then we have been given that one of the group decides to estimate the survival of group members using Gompert's law with the force of mortality at age X given by the following. 
first part is comment on the choice of formula for the force of mortality this is more or less straight book work not getting into this uh, part 2 calculate the expected number of people that will be at the next dinner stating any assumptions you may so first assumption to begin with you know what i see is there are around 29 people who attended on 29th of 2020 so i will assume that these 29 are the only set of people and we are assuming that nobody else enters this particular group because in case they do then uh, the calculation will become not that straightforward so natural assumption is you assume that only these 29 group of people are there second obviously you assume that this force of mortality is valid uh, to all these individuals okay so now what we're looking for is the expected number of people who will be at the next dinner so next dinner is going to be on 29th feb 2024 so once who were born in 1948 i mean today they were age 72 after four years their age will be 76 ones whose age today was 68 after four years their age would be 72 and ones who are aged today 64 they will be age 68 after four years so um can you all just confirm me once through chat box i hope my screen is visible to all of you i forgot to check that i hope it's visible right now it's having question one of cs2 paper a uh, okay perfect so question one this is what we have expected value or the expected number of people who would be attending is gonna be 3 into 4p72 plus 8 into 4p68 plus 18 into 4p64 and then we have this formula of tpx i have not uh, shown the derivation over here Honestly, I didn't even get the time to cross check this. I just did it once uh, in case you all find any sort of error, plus minus some error, silly calculation error. Please let me know later on. Uh, in case you observe it right now itself and are very sure about it, you can just let me know. I'll just note it down. I would be obviously checking it later post this session only, but just gonna assume for the timing key what I have done is fine. And again, the intention of this session is not uh, more on getting the absolute uh, you know correct solution more on the approach you know how you're going to tackle this if something like this comes in the exam next time something which is a bit different something which you not have solved in the past years or in material then how you're going to go about it so this one to begin with was a fairly straightforward question nothing different although i saw at least four to five scripts uh all of them have got at least one or the other parts wrong either with respect to calculation with respect to interpretation some of them simply just assume force of modality to be constant and they computed it. Uh, so again, this is something they have not asked this type of, you know, application of Gompot in this way, in a slightly different way they have. But nonetheless, I felt this was a more direct question of the paper and, you know, uh, the ones who were well prepared, who probably had their calm, they should have got this completely right. It was actually the scoring part of the paper. So 4P64, I was getting these values, 4P68, 4P72, expected number, I was getting it uh, 28.312234, just saying it to be 28 nearest integer. So we started with around 29 people and we expect that uh, the expected number of them attending in the next uh, meetup, which is after four years, is going to be roughly 28. So this was the first one. Part two, which was, and note that there are marks available for assumptions as well. Possibly this could be breakup of, you know, let's say either four marks or three marks for the working and one or two marks for the assumptions. Then it's given that a new member born on 29 Feb 1960 asks to join the group. Calculate the expected cost of dinners for this member up to and including 29 Feb 2040 if each dinner costs 60 per person and ignoring interest and inflation which is pretty good that they have already mentioned, even if it wasn't, your natural assumption would be that you are ignoring the time value of money as well as inflation. That is, if it's going to cost 60 pound uh, per person for the dinner today, we can assume that it's going to cost us the same for the future period as well. If you want to assume some sort of inflation, very well, you could have done it. In this question, you can't. They have specifically asked you, no, let's say if it was not mentioned that you know you need to ignore interest or inflation. In that case, you could have assumed inflation rate, you could have assumed whatever rate you want. 
थ्री परसेंट फाइव परसेंट टेन परसेंट ट्वेंटी परसेंट डिपेंडिंग फ्रॉम विच पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड यू आर लेट्स फ्रॉम इंडिया रीजनेबल अजम्पन वुड बी लेट्स एनीवेयर बिटवीन सिक्स टू टेन परसेंट इफ यू आर फ्रॉम लेट्स से समवेयर इन द यूरोपियन कंट्रीज यूके और लेट्स से यूएस एंड ऑल यू माइट विश टू अज्यूम लोअर रेट ऑफ इन्फ्लेशन बिकॉज दैट इज वॉट यू यूजली एक्सपीरियंस इन दैट पर्टिकुलर रीजन and in case you happen to be from some other country uh, maybe a slightly uh, underdeveloped country or developing one which tend to uh, experience uh, fairly high rates of inflation uh, not all the ones but usually so you might even feel to free to assume you know 15% 20% so again whatever you assume whatever you calculate uh, ifoa should be awarding marks for that again not for this question here they are categorically mentioned it's for the next time you know whenever you are attempting any paper this is our thought process should be in case any uh, detail you feel is not there you make an assumption state it when i say me i mean obviously state it in the paper and solve accordingly and you should be duly rewarded for unless your assumption is something which is contradicting to the information given in question that's a different case i mean then you will not be getting marks or uh, might get set marks maybe but definitely not full marks but if something is there which is not clear in the question or if it is missing uh, always state your assumption and go So now for this person who is born on 1960, he joins the group, and today is 29th Feb. So his or her age was 60. Now he or she is gonna attend uh, this particular dinner next in 2024. So we are gonna have one dinner 2024, 2028, 32, 36, 45 dinners in total. Current age of this person is 60. Probability of it being alive in these different times is gonna be 4 p 60, 8 p 60, 12 p 60, 16 p 60, and 20 p 60 respectively. And 60 is the cost of each of the dinner. So when it comes to computation, this becomes my expected cost: 60 into 4 p 60 plus 8 p 60, 12 p 60, 16 p 60, 20 p 60, so on. We can substitute the values of x, which is 60, t, which is you know different for different them, and calculate accordingly. So what I was getting was roughly two seventy nine point six nine two four, so I'm going to be two eighty uh, pounds to the nearest integer. So this was the first question. Uh, now let's say before moving forward, a couple of you just let me know through chat box ki whether you you know got this question correct or not. Specifically parts two and three. Did any one of you get the answers which I have discussed over here? Or somewhere near to it, you know, you might have differences in the maybe fifth or sixth decimal place, which is fine. depending on how you have gone about your intermediate calculation ah uh, okay so one of you shruti has got it correct okay good to see that hmm okay so next moving forward question number 2 oh This is where you know. Uh, so this question, everyone was like, you know, what sort of question is this? I haven't done anything like that, and so on. It's from extreme value theory. Uh, it has not been tested that much. I mean, it was introduced to our actual syllabus altogether in two thousand nineteen only. Like a couple of topics, say copulas, those some of you think were introduced in two thousand nineteen. That is not the case. It has always been there. Maybe tested in certain other papers like SP nine, SP six. If I remember correctly, maybe in SP seven or SP eight also there is a slight touch of copula. SP six it is definitely there. Uh, and SP nine obviously it is there in a further more detail. So that is not something new to the actual curriculum of IFPA or IIA as such. But uh, it was something which was there in another paper. It came in CS two. EVT was a relatively newer topic in the actual curriculum. Uh, at least the papers i have looked into I mean couple of sp papers i have not looked into i mean the life insurance one pension one but i don't think uh, those would be having evt these mostly should be either in finance investment or let's say you know gi papers so there it wasn't there so naturally some of you didn't get that many questions to practice and so on which is fair to begin with but this question is something if you would have read the material also the acted material you should have been in a position to get this One caveat I will definitely notice. I mean, I tend to solve everything on paper. I don't use it on board. I mean, for me, it's a time waste. You all have to give the exam on board, so you have to practice it. I do it just to you know save my time, and you know, uh, presentation is usually a bit more better if I try to do it over board. So if I'm trying to do this on board for the first time, I do understand that it's very difficult. Uh, 
typing down all these things, putting down the values, it's very difficult to see. But had anyone of you tried to solve this on paper, it would have been fairly straightforward. I mean, when I saw this question, so this was the first question I did because uh, a couple of them uh, uh, in the office told me that, you know, uh, question two, question three, very difficult, something has never happened. And one of them just saying, you know, can you just uh, show how question two is done? So I just took a piece of paper and I started solving it. And uh, it took me what, like maybe five, six minutes to get it done. That is it. On paper, on word, I do get it would have been difficult to solve it. And uh, there are other questions that, you know, where I will talk about key naturally if you're doing it direct on word visualization becomes a challenge. But then again, all of you who sat for CS2 this session would have realized it firsthand. Once you are planning to sit at any point of time in future, this paper, as I've mentioned time and again, is a bit different from CM1, CS1, CM2, CB1, CB2 in itself is a slightly different paper. CP paper, SP paper are all different. CS2 will force you to do things uh, which you might not have done in your preparation. Some of you might have been preparing that way for you all. CS2 would be like any other paper, but some of you have a different way of preparation. Uh, some of you just uh, follow the pattern of you know doing what is there in material, material questions you'll do. You are attending any classes, be it my classes, somebody else's class, it does not matter. You'll just uh, study what we would have taught in class. Anything else we would have asked you to do it separately. You might have just skipped it because you were running short of time or for whatever reasons, or you'll just do the past papers and, you know, expect something like that comes up in CS2, like the ones who have studied uh, for few topics, like Markov chain, I always say, if you have time, do not look at the solution, try to do it yourself. Want to take one month to solve the entire set of past questions. Do take, again, if you have the liberty of time, avoid looking at the solutions. And uh, I mean, a very, I will say, you know, uh, uh, I mean, if you remove the time constraint, it's always better if you do not look at the solution. The moment you look at it, you have a reference in mind, this is how you need to solve it, which is fine from exam point of view, but it does not help you to develop your own thinking. Only when you look at some things new and, you know, force yourself to think and come up with that. I mean, the satisfaction you get is tremendous. Uh, trust me on that. And, uh, I mean, your brain automatically works that way. And if something else new comes up, you know where to start. I mean, your starting point, you know, your end point would be usually known in the question. And in between, you would be able to make the necessary manipulation. So again, these things just does not come that you take a question, you try to solve it once, it does not come. You refer to solution, you understand it done. It, it doesn't work that way. For some of you, again, it might work. Uh, I work on probabilities, honestly, for out of 100, if for one or two of you, it has worked, you might have cleared. I mean, fine, okay, but for most of them, it doesn't work. So, uh, not too scared, but again, to, you know, re-emphasize, uh, I mean, you need to be pretty, pretty uh, serious with respect to your C uh, CS2 preparation and you have to follow certain techniques, even if you haven't. I mean, some of you come from a very strong bias. Uh, no, sir, this has worked for me. I will do this way. It has worked for my entire school life and so on. Forget your school life. I mean, school was a cave walk, relatively speaking. Most of the boards, at least which I am aware of, be it CBC, ISC, like the board exams are nothing. They will ask you almost everything which you have covered in material. Uh, there will be very few questions which will force you to think out of box. Maybe in certain different boards, international board, or maybe in certain state boards. It might be different, uh, but definitely not much for CBC, ISC. At least uh, till 2016-17, I could say. Like I did my class 12 in 2014 and after 2-3 years also, I did uh, take a look at the papers and my zoomies were there. If again, some new development has come in recent years, it's a different thing. I doubt that has come. So just because it has worked in the past does not mean. You need to identify the factors, you know, why something has worked. So in one, uh, when I was probably in class 9 or class 10, there was this uh, student uh, in my classroom who used to mug up maths, you know, and uh, that student, uh, you know, did end up scoring uh, more as well. So, you know, what we used to have were two exams for maths and best of two was taken. First paper was very easy. Second paper was very difficult. So this individual, I will not take the name, had scored 20 out of 20 in the first one. And in the second one, which was the more difficult one, this student or uh, this batchmate of mine had scored probably six or seven. Would have, I mean, that student actually plumped. But since it was best of two, that student got a 20. I scored probably what 18, 19 in both of them, and I ended up scoring less. So again, that sort of technique would have worked. You know, you would have even scored a hundred. 
but when it comes to you know uh, these papers and even certain other professional courses you need to apply just because something has worked does not mean it will work so you need to be considerate of the factors you need to keep in mind uh, so again just stretched a little bit but again i want to use this opportunity so that anyone who watches this video later on understands uh, that cs2 is relatively difficult but again you know don't take this as an opportunity to defer the exam for cs2 you will think maybe i have to change this exam back to offline they do something else in future what not i have been seeing this from 2017 onwards many of you all you know, who had started in 2017-18 did not sit for any exam in 2019 when the new curriculum came in because you all thought new curriculum is coming things will be new things will be difficult so on and you will just find uh, ways to you know defer your examination i mean now new platform system hopefully comes from uh, april 24 session for certain exams CB1, CB2, CP1, SP, SA papers where online proctoring would be there. Some of you are like, you know, there's a new platform, things will be new, it might be difficult, you don't mind, you're going to defer your talk. For me, that is plain stupidity. There will be always something new coming up or there is this always risk of something new coming up, no point deferring it as such. I mean, it's also expected that uh, probably by September of next year, they are going to shift CS, CM papers as well towards the new platform. Not sure how they're going to do it if the paper pattern remains same, different or all. You never know. I mean, it's a matter of time that they are going to shift these papers as well eventually. Because currently with this non-proctored, I mean, uh, as for many of you exams have become a joke that way. So naturally it will. So anyone uh, who has studied, let's say, CM1, CS1, as well as let's say CM2, especially CS1, CM1, I mean, CS2, and especially if you are not working, you have a lot of time once you start working in corporate setup. Uh, time is not on a side as such. So, I mean, you are getting an April term. It's the usually longer one. Utilize it to give CS2. I mean, you will find 10 different reasons to not give the exam because you don't want to. And at the same time, I can give you or you yourself can give you a self 10, 50, 100 reasons to give the exam if you actually want to. So, just because papers are coming difficult uh, does not make sense to say that it will remain a continuity. You will find all sort of logic. Four papers have been difficult. Next paper will also be difficult. It will go a trend. I first change it. They want to make it difficult. Some of you might just say, you know, four papers difficult. Fifth one, they might want to keep it easy. So you don't know whether it's going to be easy or difficult. No point thinking about it. I mean, first try to control what you can, which is your preparation, your own attitude, and then uh, think about the other variables. So don't defer your exam just because of it. I mean, if you're going there, go with realistic expectations, especially if you are a student with average intellectual. Uh, but for hard working, I mean, there is a slight possibility that even after putting in all of our effort, you might not clear the paper, which is fine. I mean, we all tend to fail. I have personally failed as well. Maybe not in actual exams, course, but in a lot of other things in life as well. So that is perfectly fine. I mean, you need to at least try and experience. So it's okay. So now quickly moving forward to question number two. Uh, let Xn be a sequence of independent and identically distributed random variables. Demonstrate that the distribution function of Xn uh, f satisfies this, where f is nothing but the CDF basically. So it should be in the form of 1 minus 1 by n whole into 1 plus c x minus a by b whole to the power minus 1 by c whole to the power n so on. Xn is uniformly distributed on 0, 1. They have given alpha and beta and a, b, c. So effectively, what we need to do is we need to refer to actual tables. They could not remember anything. Refer to CDN. Okay. Then you need to simply show LHS equal to RHS. I mean, we'll take you back to what you might supposed to do in your maths uh, exam papers in school, maybe in class 9, 10, 11, 12. You always had LHS equal to RHS, which is what exactly you had to do. Part A is something you could have even done it on the board. Part B definitely, I would say, it would have been more difficult given you have these n to the power 1 by delta and so many terms. And that's a bit more, I will say, not direct, uh, not that simple to uh, comprehend. But if you would have done this on paper, you would have got it like within 10 minutes or maybe 15 minutes. I got it 5-6 minutes. Some of you would have got even before that. But yeah, I mean, 10 minutes is something you would have got. And for a 6 marks question, if you're getting it correct in 10 minutes, which is pretty good, especially in CS2, it's like pretty good that way. So if I'll take you through the solution of this. Uh... So this is over here. 
shown uh, as many steps as I can. And again, you know, uh, some of you who would be looking at these videos, uh, the purpose of this video is mostly to, you know, give a high level discussion of the solutions of the paper so that ones uh, who are a bit uh, confused regarding what papers they want to take, they can look at this video, get an estimate of the marks and decide uh, for the paper accordingly without having to wait for 10 weeks for the results. Don't take it as, uh, you know, this is the way you need to exactly uh, show in the exam, these many steps. I mean, for some questions, I give very detailed steps that might not be even required in exam. For some, I give extremely small steps or I just mentioned the uh, gist part. So do not take uh, the content shared in these videos as the ideal way of representing your answer. There's a separate forum, separate uh, thing where we discuss that all together. This is more just to discuss the questions uh, and you know what their uh, ideal solutions should be. So over as you'll see, x and four is uniform 0, 0,1. Now fx is nothing but x minus a by b minus a, which simplifies to x for a uniform 0, 0,1. So f of a n plus b n x. So I substitute the value of a n and b n. So I get this f of 1 minus 1 by n plus x by n. So this entire thing, let's say, acts as y. f of y is nothing but y. So I'll be getting nothing but simply 1 minus 1 by n plus x by n, which can be consolidated and expressed in this way. 1 plus x minus 1 by n. So now LHS becomes 1 plus x minus 1 by n whole to the power n. Coming to RHS, you put in the values of A, B, and C, and you'll see it's coming to the same thing. That's it. This is all you had to do. You would have got it right. Part two. It's a Pareto distribution instead of usual parameters, which we tend to use alpha lambda. It's uh, rather here given to be delta and lambda. So now we have the CDF. If you do not remember it by heart, you can obviously refer to actual tables. One minus lambda by lambda plus x to the part delta. Now, a n plus b n, I substitute the values of a n and b n, I get this. So, this is instead of x, I have this term. So, in the denominator, I put this entire thing. Now, you will see that uh, one term will be can getting cancelled out, which is lambda, and then there comes a minus lambda over here. So, it will be x n to the power 1 by delta plus lambda into n to the power 1 by delta. So, uh, I can take n common out, and you know, uh, I guess over here, uh, Sorry, n to the power 1 by delta, you can take common. And when you to do it to the power delta, 1 by n comes out common. And you're left with lambda by lambda plus x whole to the power delta. So this becomes my LHS. And in the RHS, again, if you put in the values of a, b, and c, you get in this form. And again, LHS equal to RHS over here. So let's then part 2, 8 marks. This is also where many of you did struggle. Uh, Explain the significance of the results in part one by considering the limiting behavior of the right hand side as n tends to infinite. So this entire term as n tends to infinite. So you'll have to use the fact that you know e to the power x is nothing but a uh, limit n tending to infinite one plus x by n whole to the power n. This gives us nothing but e to the power x, something which we have done in our class as well. And the ones who are uh, going through acted material, it would have been there itself. Again, eight marks, so there would be various other things you need to write. So this mathematical thing, which I'm going to discuss uh, over here is. So this is the fact which we're using limit one plus six by n whole to the power n is nothing but e to the power x. So when I start with the uniform one, on the RHS, I have one plus x minus one by n whole to the power n. So this becomes nothing but e to the power x minus 1. And if I use for Pareto 1, then this becomes something like e to the power minus lambda by lambda plus x whole to the power delta. Now if we'll take a look, uh, and if we'll take a look at the GEV distribution, which is given there in the material itself, the general form, when gamma is not equal to 0. In case gamma is equal to 0, it's a different structure. But when the shape, uh, or sorry, uh, yeah, when the gamma is not 0, you're getting something in this form e to the power minus one plus lambda into x minus a by beta whole to the power minus one by gamma. And both of these are in similar format. So if we'll put alpha as zero, beta as one, gamma as minus one, the above simplifies to e to the power x minus one. And when you put alpha as this, beta as this, gamma as this, it simplifies to this term. Now you'll understand and if we'll compare this alpha is nothing but corresponding to a, which is given in the question. Beta is nothing but b given in the question. Gamma is nothing but C given in the question. 
So again, if you think with a cool head, which obviously is difficult for you all in the exam, and that is why I keep on saying, at least the one who's studying from me, you know, do sit for past papers, solve them under exam conditions, mark yourself, so that you can develop, you know, in that three hour, 20 minutes, you do not panic. You see something difficult to keep a cool head, at least all those questions. And I'm telling you on the day of exam, like I, I will say maybe during the last two, three days, you want to remain underconfident, we remain underconfident. Last two days, I mean, be confident, not I will say very overconfident, be confident, you know, even if you have not studied well, just be confident because sometimes that confidence helps in the exam. It has helped me, it has helped a lot of them because once you have cool head, Ki yes, ye to ho I will do this. If I have time, I will get into it. I'll think about it. I'll do it. Just that the moment you have, I mean, you will start looking at the solution of it. Not all questions will get it, but even if you're getting any one correct, I mean, that's going to really help you uh, in your examination. So that is why you need to keep your head cool. And all these logics, like, you know, first I will solve questions from backwards or frontwards or serially, all these are plain stupid, I will say. I just mentioned. Take a look at the question paper, read it, maybe devote five, 10 minutes, maximum 10 minutes. I will say, see the questions which you would have solved, which you know, you can solve. Do not see the topics, which you feel you're strong on. Judge the question basis, its merit, not that you are strong in a topic does not mean that the question coming from the chapter, you will be strong in it. Take a look at question, anything which looks familiar, which you feel you would be able to get it has reasonable marks. If you can make that judgment amount of time it might require. Attempt those questions first. Right now it's word examination. You can change it later on as well. If some of you have OCD that you want to put it serially, you can do it later as well. So some of you I have seen you tend to start from behind. I mean, obviously in certain papers, the last couple of questions tend to be of more marks, but following that does not make sense always. You know, some place is fine, but if you do not know that question, you start with it, you get stuck with it, your flows goes bad. Most of you go uh, not that well prepared from the point of view of, you know, sitting in actual exam environment. And that is not something I will honestly tell you. It's something for me or any other teacher to force you along. It is your life. End of the day, you need to find that environment to do it. Every time you can't expect, you know, uh, I'm going to keep 50 tests following the center and then give it. You are at, at your home. If home environment does not allow you, you can go to your library. You can go to a lot of other places. It, the drive should come from inside of yourself itself. You know, you want to do something, achieve something. So this is what you need to do. So don't wait for anyone else, be it your teacher, be it your friend, be it anyone else. It should come from you only. I mean, of all the ones, you should be the one you should be accountable, you know, towards yourself first before being accountable to anyone else or anyone else being accountable to you. So sit, I mean, you know, do sit. I mean, you have papers from 2005 to 2023 from IFA. If you have solved those, even if you're not giving from IA, solve IA papers. In CS2, the, I mean, see, one way is if you're very smart, fine, you might solve less questions, you might get it correct in exam, fine. For those, I mean, uh, I don't even need to give any suggestion, fine. But for ones who are of, let's say, average intelligence or who need to work really hard, you need to solve a lot of questions in CS2. The more different questions you solve, my natural assumption is something similar comes in exam, at least you'll be able to solve that. So solve more questions. I mean, pick up IA pastel papers. All of you are always looking for fancy mock papers or mock paper, mock paper. Half of you have not even solved, you know, last 10 year questions of CS2. What will you do with mock paper? I mean, just you want something presented and packaged to you saying, you know, are a mock paper here. Uh, somebody else might be giving three paper, mock paper, 12 mock paper, 20 mock paper, whatever. The questions are coming from past years only, just that they are shuffled or what, so that you cannot probably determine. I mean, those mostly would be coming from past year questions itself. So instead of going for fancy stuff, you can solve all IFA questions. If you're giving from IFA, next, solve from IA. Obviously, there will be difficult questions, but okay, fine, you skip that. Or keep in mind, okay, okay, you know, in your IFA exam, that difficult level questions will not come, but at least attempt to practice it. What if something like that one question comes? Maybe you have practiced it. Maybe you have not understood the question, but you know how to solve it. You will still get marks. When I sat for my CT6 exam, so CS2 is CT6 and CT4. So of all the papers I prepared initially, you know, CT6 was one which I felt I was horribly prepared for. See, I ended up securing all India rank one is a different thing altogether, but I was the most ill prepared as per my standards for that paper. But on the day of exam, I mean, when I gave from my FOA, the paper was pretty easy. I was literally singing uh, during giving the exam because I was very tense. 
I didn't have the chance to solve any past year paper or mock paper else. I mean, for CT1, CT3, I have solved absolutely all the papers at that point of time. From 2005 onwards, whatever is there in IFO, IA website, I had solved each one of them under exam conditions. So the point here was that you need to practice, I mean, very different questions. Okay, you need to do that. So this was question two. Next, uh, moving forward. Uh, question number three. Uh -huh. Okay. Markov chain is there. Again, like uh, the scripts which I saw, none of them got right. And again, I will myself say I'm not, uh, since I didn't even get time to cross check my solutions, I usually tend to cross check my solutions, especially for something which is a bit new. I haven't got the time. I'm just coming with the hope today uh, that whatever I've done is correct. Else, obviously, I'm putting the rectifications later uh, in case I see any sort of calculation error, which is fine, but any sort of conceptual error. I mean, even I wouldn't like that, you know, discussing something wrong and then later uh, having to rectify it. So, question three also, I mean, uh, like, you know, part one, part two, forget there is something called Markov chain. You know, probability. All of you must have done it in school level, at least when the ones who had maths. Maybe some of you didn't have maths. Don't know probability. Okay. Everyone else, this question part one and two, anyone who knows probability can attempt this question and get it completely correct. Obviously, with the help of Markov chain, you get to do it a bit more easier. And obviously, to understand how this transition matrix works or how we interpret it, you need to know Markov chain. But again, the ones who have studied will understand. It's nothing but probability which you need to find out. The question is only asking us to calculate the probability. With Markov chain techniques, it might be a bit easier. Without it, it would be a bit more longer. But still, you can do it. And this should have been done. I will say at least part one. Part two also. I mean, part two I solved it. took me very less time and I'm still suspicious, you know, whether I have done something wrong. Six marks for something I did pretty quickly or I will say not even quickly but with very less number of steps. So, I'm still... Uh, want to and I'll some point of time maybe in the next two three weeks i'll have a bit more time and i will be looking into it but for the timing i'll uh, discuss uh basically the solution i did it at first go itself so if we look at the question uh alex can choose salad pizza or sushi for lunch on monday alex starts with a uniformly random choice so on monday alex can choose either salad or pizza or sushi with uniformly random choice which means all of these have equal probability so it's a slightly different question for the first day of the week. That is on Monday. You have a different distribution, different transition probabilities. But for the following days, you know, let's say Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so on. There's a markup chain given. Where the first, second and third rows and columns correspond to salad, pizza and sushi. So you could write S-A-P-S-U to represent. Or you can also write A-B-C where A means salad, B means pizza, C means sushi. Derive the probability that Alex has pizza on Monday and salad on Wednesday. So some of you, what all did was, you know, you all assumed that Alex had pizza on Monday. You all took it as given and then calculate the probability that they had salad on Wednesday. Which the question is not sitting. It's not that given Alex had pizza on Monday. It is asking you to conclude that Alex has pizza on Monday and salad on Wednesday. So let's say your Monday, if you want to denote as X0, X0 was pizza and X2 was nothing but salad. So we need probability X0 equal to pizza and X2 equal to salad. Many of you, what you solved was probability X2 is equal to salad given X0 is pizza. You will found a condition probability. And I will say it was very convenient all of you because then it made your life easy. I mean, assume Monday ko pizza kaya hai. Then you just need to find P square. That is it. So it made life easy. But again, I will say a very convenient choice. And again, read the question. I mean, I have stated something, you know, in actuarial. Sadly, I will say you need to be fluent a bit in your English. I used to hate English. I never even bothered about it. I mean, post teaching, I have to be a bit more careful. I I have understood that like communication is important and the way you need to you know communicate something and ensure that the person is also comprehending on the same lines. And even when you're reading the question, you need to understand what they're asking. So that is why I say read the question again. You feel your week on grammar, work on it, 
understand what the question is asking you to do. So here, I mean, three scripts I remember. God knows if they discussed during exam or what, I don't know. Maybe they did it. Or if they did this only. Either it was a very convenient assumption to do because it made your life easier ki haan, this is something which you have done in the past year or God knows uh, what they would have done. But they definitely got this wrong. So one of is giving is, but they've given the transition matrix as on Monday itself. So it's written on Monday, Alex starts with a uniformly random choice, but in the following days, makes the choices following a discrete time mark of chain. So this transition matrix, if you want to interpret it as on the, I mean, the row vectors, it's what we, let's say, had on uh, day I and on the next day, what we're having day I plus one. This is applicable for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. On Monday, it is not the case. So let's say if on Friday you're having sushi, then if you want to compute what is going to happen on next Monday, you cannot use P. On Monday, it's uniformly distributed only. It's 1 by 3 for all salad, pizza and sushi. Again, that is my interpretation so far. So if you want to interpret as this 0 0.3, this is the probability that last day given it had pizza, next day it is going to have pizza. And this is valid for let's say Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or maybe let's say even Saturday, Sunday. For Monday, this is not valid. So if you had pizza on Sunday, your probability of having pizza on Monday is not 0 0.3. Or your probability of having, uh, what is this? Second one was, uh, sorry, first one is salad actually, sorry. So what I'm saying is, let's say you had salad on Sunday. Your probability of having salad on Monday is not 0 0.3. Probability of having pizza is not 0 0.2. Probability of having sushi is not 0 0.5. Again, in my understanding, it's 1 by 3, 1 by 3, 1 by 3 for Monday. For other days, these set of things work. So now let me go through all the solution. Maybe uh, that might resonate with a couple of you who have doubts with this. Transition matrix for Monday. I mean, like starting point is, let's say, you know, Sunday night. Monday, what can you have? You can have anything. You can have salad, pizza, sushi. I'll say it's probability 1 by 3, 1 by 3, 1 by 3. Now, given you had something on Monday, for Tuesday, it's going to be this. Given you had something on Tuesday, this is going to be the case for Wednesday and so on for Thursday, Friday, and maybe let's say Saturday, Sunday as well. So required probabilities, first entry of below matrix. I mean, this corresponds to the entry. And why am I saying this is because, you know, uh, this corresponds to you had a uh, uh, pizza on first day. I mean, it's given in this order, pizza. Let me just check. Have I mistaken something? First, second, and third row and column correspond to salad, pizza, and sushi. Salad, pizza, and sushi. Okay. So, at pizza on Monday. Okay. Now, pizza, then Britain so should be actually second row. Salad, pizza, and sushi. Pizza is there and we need salad on Wednesday. So, it should be actually second row and third column. Uh, what have I written? Is first entry of below matrix. Achha, anyway, I have taken one by three to come down to second entry itself. So, I mean... Forget Markov chain once, okay. First try to do it normally itself. 0 0.1 or uh, let's say 1 by 3 is the probability you have pizza on Monday. And then you need to have sushi. Uh, it's sushi only, right? Uh, it's salad on Wednesday. So on Tuesday, you can have anything. You can have either pizza, either sushi or salad. But on Wednesday, you need to have salad. So I start with 0 0.1. 0 0.1 is nothing but probability that given last day you have... Uh, uh, pizza, you're going to have salad on the first day. So 0 0.1 is for salad. Now, if you have had salad, from salad to salad again is nothing but a, a salad on Wednesday. So salad is the first one. This is salad. Uh, so it's going to be 0 0.3 itself. Given you had a salad on the previous day, you are having salad on the next day, 0 0.3. So 0 0.1 into 0 0.3. Next, 0 0.3 is nothing but you basically having pizza on Tuesday. You had pizza on Tuesday, now having salad on Wednesday is into 0 0.2. I have multiplied by 0 0.1. Okay, wait, 0 0.3. Okay, 0 0.3 is, uh, wait, something looks inconsistent over here. I had pizza on first day, so I'm going to look at this column. Okay, sorry. I had pizza on Monday. So 0 0.3 is nothing down my probability of having salad on a Tuesday. And now once I have salad, my probability of having salad on next day is again 0 
So I have done 0 0.1. This seems to be incorrect. This should not be the case because this corresponds to pizza and this is salad. It should have been 0 0.3. Ignore that. And then what I have over here is uh, 0 0.6. This is the probability of having, let's say, a uh, sushi on a uh, Tuesday. And if I'm having sushi, 0 0.6 into 0 0.3, 0 0.6 into 0 0.3. So something looks inconsistent over here. Uh, let me just check because I had done this two ways. Answer was styling in both the ways. Let me just look at this again. I had these on first day, which is one by three. Next day, if I want to have salad and again, I want to have salad. So if I had salad 0 0.3, okay, Tuesday. Now if I want to have salad on Wednesday, this for my salad. This is salad, right? Salad. So it should be 0 0.3 into 0 0.3. Hmm. I have multiplied this with this. Yes, that seems to be the case. Uh, but I would have done that. Or is the first entry something which is incorrect? 0 0.136, 136, 0 0.31. Multiply this, but why would I do that? Pizza and this. Got P square. I'm just trying to look at uh, without transition matrix. So it's pizza one by three on Monday. Then on Tuesday, again, let's say it has pizza. It's going to be 0 0.3. And from 0 0.3, meat salad, it's going to be again. Uh, okay. This 0 0.1 is for that. 0 0.1 into 0 0.3. 0 0.1, I had pizza again, which is fine. I need to look at second row only. So once I had pizza, now I need to have again salad, which is 0 0.3. So 0.1 into 0.3, first entry makes sense. Second entry, I had salad, 0 0.3. So now if I have salad, I need to move towards the first column. And in first column, I again have salad. So it's barely 0 0.3 square. Ideally, should have been that only. And then if I'm having 0 0.6, I should move to this one. And then again, it should be 0 0.6 into I need to have salad from sushi. It's need to be 0 0.2. This should be 0 0.2. So 0 0.1 to 0 0.21. Okay. It's still coming 0 0.24. Okay. So this is incorrect. It should be ideally 0 0.3 into 0 0.3, which will be 0 0.09. This will be 0 0.6 into 0 0.2, which will be 0 0.12, which makes it 0 0.21 and plus 0 0.23. So answer will remain the same 0 0.08. But if you are the steps is wrong, please make that adjustment. Good. I got that while discussing in this session itself. So I will write it as well if you want. It will be something like this. You can think this way Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So one by three. See, one way is pizza, pizza, salad. One way is pizza. Sushi, salad, one is pizza, salad, salad. So pizza, salad, salad, one by three is for Monday. Then again, pizza. So again, for pizza, what I'm going to have is, as per the question, I need to look at the second column because this corresponds to pizza. I need to again have what next day? Pizza, which is nothing but 0 0.1. Where did it go? Where did it go? into 0 0.1. Now I'm on pizza. I need to have a salad, which is nothing but 0. Point, uh, sorry, 0 0.1 is again for salad added. Hmm. So this is one by three. You had pizza. Now you want to have pizza. So you need to look at this column. This is pizza over here. This becomes for your, you know, salad, pizza, sushi. So 0 0.3 will multiply. And now I want salad. Salad is nothing but 0 0.1. This will be also one by three into I had, let's say sushi. So sushi is nothing but 0 0.6. Now on Tuesday, when I am on sushi, I need to look at now third column for my Wednesday part and I want salad over here. Salad nothing but corresponds to 0 0.3. It's going to be 0 0.6 into 0 0.3. And this will be 1 by 3 into I had pizza on Monday. I want to have salad. So salad is nothing but 0 0.1. And once you have salad, I will look at the first row. So 0 0.1 again into nothing but 0 0.3. 
Now, if you can take 1 by 3 common, you will get uh, 1 by 3 into 0 0.24, I guess. This is nothing but 0 0.01. This is nothing but 0 0.06. And this again is nothing but 0 0.01. So, total your brain is nothing but 0 0.08. Uh, could I have to, don't have to put the rectifications later on. And let's see, even if you do P square, then you are getting this itself. 0 0.24 is this entry. So this was part one. Derive is there. You could have explained this in words as well. I have written like AP square 1 by 3 into P square. So on. Now part two, which was the more difficult part, I would say. Calculate the probability that Alex has sushi on Wednesday and Friday. Uh, so doing P square will fetch full marks. One of you is asking, uh, I'm not sure it's written, derive the probability. Honestly, I'll wait for the examiner report to come. I mean, if not full marks, we would be getting some marks. Uh, if you have done this P square, you won't get the answer because you need to multiply by 1 by 3 as well. So it's P square into 1 by 3, technically speaking. So if you have just written P square, not getting marks. If you are just putting 0 0.24, I don't think so getting marks for that. So part 2. So here again, what they're asking is sushi on Wednesday and Friday. What happens on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, not given. You need to look at all possible parts. There will be a lot of ways to look at it. You know, let's say, just to show it to you, like a tree diagram, you know, if you want. You have Monday, you have Tuesday, you have Wednesday, you have Thursday, you have Friday. You only need to have sushi. Sushi was it, I guess. Yeah, sushi. And you need to have sushi over here. So here, there could be three possibilities. Salad, pizza, sushi. Salad, pizza, sushi. Salad, pizza, sushi. Need to consider all possible parts. That is one way to do six marks. We'll have probably what? Three into three into three. 27 different possibilities. I would say one, 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 two, three, then six, nine. Yeah, 27 different probabilities to do. Now again, this would take time. You'll get the correct answer fine. Now this is where Marco Chen technique helps wherein you could have done it more efficiently as well. So I hope this is clear, you know, this is what it is looking. So try to understand the question at a broader aspect as well, especially these probability things. It's more easier to understand intuitively. Other things are a bit technical. You might not always understand them that easily. This should be clear. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. This is given, this is given. Or they are saying, calculate ki Wednesday it's sushi, Friday it's sushi. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday it could be possibly any of the three. So we need to consider all possible situations. So what I can do is, I can what first calculate is, you know, on first day, let's say it can be anything. It can either be uh, salad, pizza, sushi, okay. Now, let's say if I consider it to be salad, okay. Given it's salad on Monday, I need to find on Wednesday, it is sushi. And given it is sushi on Wednesday, I need to find sushi on Friday. What some of you did was simply did P to the power 4. Wrong. Because P to the power says what? Given today you are at some position. After 4 6 you will be at this position. It incorporates all possibilities in time 2, time 3, time 4. Here, if this is time 0, this is time 1, this is time 2, this is time 3, this is time 4. You are looking for this probability. Probability x4 is sushi and x2 is sushi. What some of you did conveniently was calculated probability x4 is equal to sushi given that x0 is equal to pizza because this is nothing but p to the power 4. 6 marks you won't get for that. I mean because you could use R programming to calculate you can even use google like I uh, I don't know R programming yet properly. I use google multiplication calculator there was this thing. I calculated it through matrix multiplication as well just to cross check my answer. So I'm getting it. You're not getting 6 marks for that. Okay. So means something could else be there. So again, if you read the question, it is very difficult for me to comprehend why one would not have got this. Obviously, they are in hurry. They do silly error is fine. But later on, also if you come and say, Ki, nahi, ye to nahi aata kabhi. You know, even I could have thought a lot. I read the question. This is the first thing it came to me. Like probability, I tend to write down. You know, how I can write it down? If not in words, in this way, it just 
just helps you know visualize how I should be approaching the calculation part. Uh -huh. so now over here. What I'm doing is, uh, think in this way, uh, you can start from any place. Let's say first I had pizza. Pizza is one by three probability. One by three into let's say P13. I mean, you find uh, P square, you find the probability P square matrix. So what I was trying to do was, first day you had anything. Let's say this is one by three probability. This is one by three. Not let's say this is the case. So let's say you had a salad on Monday. Now you need to have sushi on Wednesday. So you can find entry of P square, first row, third entry. First corresponds to, you know, salad on Monday and third corresponds to sushi on Wednesday. Next, you need to multiply this one by one by three. Next possibility is you had P's on Monday. If you had P's on Monday, you need to have sushi on Wednesday. This can be computed using the entry P square 2 comma 3. And you again multiply this with one by three, which is the probability of having P's on Monday. And same thing, P square 3 comma 3, you had sushi on Monday and you are having sushi on Wednesday. And now once you have this, you multiply it with what? You need to again find sushi to sushi. You again multiply this part with P square, 3 comma 3. Given that on Wednesday you had sushi on Friday or having sushi. So mathematically, how you could have written this was. See, this was the first step probability. X4 is sushi. And X2 is sushi. It's probability A and B. How I can do this is probability x2 is equal to sushi given x0 is equal to i into probability x4 is equal to sushi given x2 is sushi. Where here i can be anything. Sushi, pizza or salad. So there will be three possibilities for this. You need to sum this up for all values of i. Given something happen at time 0. Okay. Uh, and you need to multiply this with probability obviously x not equal to y. So first we'll start with what happened at x not probability. Given this happened at x not, what is the probability that at x2 this will be sushi? And then given at x2 it was sushi, at x4 it will be sushi. So this is gonna remain common for all the three different values of i. This is gonna be nothing but the entry of p square, third row, third column. This is gonna vary. There will be three different cases. And this is how my structure looks like. So I got the required probability as you'll see. If I calculated P square in the first part, I was able to solve this in three lines, which I still find, you know, six marks will I get for this. But then I haven't seen anything which does not make sense over to I mean, and there is no shortcut as such I've used. Obviously in words, I would have to explain what I've tried to done. Like I've written a bit more steps uh, today in the screen. So one by three into, you know, these can be taken common 1 by 3, p square 3, 3, 3, we'll get 3, 2, 1, 3, 3, 2, 2, 3, 3, 2, 3, 3. And this thing, if you think is nothing but the probability of you having sushi on Wednesday. And this is given you had sushi on Wednesday, probability of you having sushi on Friday. So the answer was coming out to be 2041 by 7500 or 0.272183. Mm -hmm. uh, what couple of you did was simply did p to the power 4. Got it? So yeah. And as you can see over here, I've written this probability here x3, x5 have used. So instead of, you know, uh, writing x0, Monday, Monday has been taken to be time 1. Instead of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, it has been taken to be, let's say, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which is also fine. Does not matter. It's the same thing. You want to start, you can make it from 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, whichever way you want to do, that is fine. Mm -hmm. I hope this question made sense to you all the approach and maybe if you look at it in retrospect, something, you know, now you will feel ki, ha, maybe this was not that difficult. I do understand on the day of exam, getting it correct is a task, but move outside that. It is something you should have been able to done by virtue of this knowing probability, how to get it done. Um, just for the purpose of, you know, uh, checking if this made sense to you all or not, if any one of you all could just confirm in chat box yes you were able to follow the explanation for this question right. at least the ones who could follow they could let me know through chat box uh, one of you has responded so far others blank others didn't understand this part two specifically part one was still straightforward 
Mm, okay, no responses. I'll take it as maybe negative. Maybe everyone has not been able to absorb. Never mind. Go back. I mean, sometime later. I don't expect all to do this today or in the next week or so. But later, you know, once at least we have sat for CSQ this session. I mean, do think about this question. I am also want to think about it because I still wonder uh, if I'm doing something wrong over here or not. Uh, next is question four. I saw none of you are doing it. Question four. I was disappointed. Again, if you didn't have the time, then it's fine. But if you had the time, you will say, no, this was difficult. Never done something like this. I'm just going to show it to you. This has been asked. Not in the direct way, but in a very similar way in past year. It's there in the revision notes as well. So over here, a teacher is looking for ways to cluster a pupil into homogeneous groups and decide to set up an experiment as follows. Every day, each people is given a task and scores plus two if the task is successfully completed at the end of the day or minus two. What we would have done if we remember in simple random work, it was plus one or minus one. The experiment runs for n days and at the end, pupils are grouped based on the total score over n days. Let us consider a pupil in the class who has a 50% chance of successfully completing the task excuse me, each day. And we assume that the performance from day to day is independent. We denote by ZT this pupil score at the end of each day T and by AT their total score from day 1 to day T. First part determines the expected value and variance of AT. This could have been done. Part 2, part 3 was the more difficult one. So part one, it's okay, even if you do not relate it to simple random walk, something like that. If you can just write the statistical structure, you could have calculated mean and variance. Part two and three, I will say, if you would have been able to see, you know, plus two minus two can be seen as twice into either plus one minus one. And then this question is already been done. At least for one, we were starting with fanatics. I mean, there's a separate video wherein, you know, we were solving Markov chain questions or doubt class, either revision notes solved or doubt class, either of them there was this question where we had solved how to compute the probability. So first, let me show you, you know, this corresponds to which question specifically for part two, three is different, but three can be done if you know part two. This is the question over here. Consider the random variable defined by Xn, summation yi, i running from one to n, where yn takes the value one or minus one with probability p and one minus p. Over here, P is, let's say, 0. 0.5. 1 minus P is also 0. 0.5. Instead of plus 1 minus 1, we have plus 2 minus 2. Does not make a difference. Structure will remain entirely the same. And then we have been asked, derive an expression for the number of upward movements in the sequence. And part 4, derive expressions for the M-step probabilities. P, I, J, M. So this is something we explained, part 4. Something which is there in the previous year. This is what you need to replicate. So, if I let you go through the brief solution which I had done for part 1 to begin with. AT is Z1 plus Z2, uh, so on till ZT, where ZT takes the value either plus 2 or minus 2 with equal probabilities and ZTs are given to be independent. So, expectation AT will be expectation Z1, expectation Z2, so on, expectation ZT. Okay, there will be T times over here, so T into expectation Z. Expectation that is coming nothing but out as zero. Since all that are independent, variance of AT will be nothing but uh, T into variance of ZT. To calculate variance of ZT or let's say Z, you find expectation Z square. So variance Z comes as four. So my variance of AT will be 14. This was part one. Part two you will see is directly comparable to your. So if I take a look at the question to begin with. Determine the probability that a n is equal to k, where k is an integer, writing your answer as a function of n and k. So you need probability a n k if you want to convert me to terms of that particular question. So you can think in this way, a n is equal to uh, over here. An is equal to Z1 plus Z2, so on till Zn, which I can write as maybe, you know, let's say uh, 2 by 1 plus 2 by 2, 2 by n, which is nothing but twice of y1 plus y2 yn, 
where y n takes the value plus one or minus one with probabilities p and one minus p. In this case, I can directly write probabilities to be nothing but 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So we need probability a n equal to k. Probability a n is equal to k is all we are looking for. Or probability a n by 2. Uh, a n is k. So a n by 2 is nothing but k by 2 and a n by 2. So next step if I write a n by 2 is nothing but y1 plus y2 y n. This is nothing but a simple random box. So let's say this is represented by let's say bn. This an by 2 is bn. So I, what I get is probability bn is nothing but k by 2. Our sum of us performed annotation. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe try to avoid that. So yeah, this is what we're looking for. Probability Bn equal to K by 2. So it's like, you know, P, I, J. After N steps. So your I will be the starting point, which is 0 over here and J is nothing but K by 2. And we'll get it. Not explaining this, uh, not spending time. It will take a lot of time to explain this. Mm -hmm. It's something which uh, at least the ones who have studied from us, they have access to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, for others, you might refer to the solution and understand yourself, um, not using this time to explain that in detail. Then moving forward to the next one. At the end of the experiment, a pupil will be classified as borderline if the total score an is 0. Determine probability a1 is equal to 2 given an equal to 0. So we want a1 equal to 2 given an is equal to 0. This is in the form of probability A given B. You can calculate a bit more easier if you remember probability A given B is nothing but probability A intersection B by probability B. So what I want is A1 is 2 and An is 0 divided by probability An is 0. And if you'll see if A1 is 2 and An is 0, this I mean, if you see probability A given B can also be written as probability B given A into probability A by probability B. So if you want, you could write this as probability A n equal to 0 given A1 equal to 2 into probability A1 equal to 2 by probability A n equal to 0. Now you would have calculated from the earlier part expression similar to this and the probability can be computed accordingly. So it's just thinking that if you want a n as 0, it means first of all n needs to be even. Because for this you will see it can take the value 0 only in even number of steps. In odd number of steps, it will not take the value 0. Uh, or will it? Plus 2 minus 2. Mm, yeah, then it will be plus 4, 0, minus 4. Then it will be either plus 6, plus 2, Correct, it won't be zero and odd number of steps. So n needs to be even, half of those it is going up step, half of those it's going down step. And then it can arrange itself in let's say nc two ways. So this needs to be computed. So this, yes, uh, again, on the day of exam, difficult to grab, I will concede that, but if you had prepared well, by preparing well means, I will say anything which you have solved, even if you don't understand, you should be able to replicate in the question. I mean, now that it's open book, our time, there was not even open book exams. So at least I used to ensure that the question which I haven't understood. And there were a lot of questions which I didn't understand. You know, it's like, okay, I'm looking at solution, but my target was, can I get this myself if I'm doing it for the first time? If not, means I have not understood that question. Well. It's like next time again, same question comes. Can I do it myself? If yes means I've understood, if no means I've not understood. In that case, I would make sure I'm learning it. Okay, okay. then as a question or if a question like this comes, this is the way to solve it. So that at least on the day of exam, I will solve it. 
first four five months of your preparation try to devote time think last one two months need to be a bit practical for most of you the end point is to clear the exam so in that case you don't have time you can remember stuff use first four three four months to think not just to solve think how else you could have done why this way is correct why another way is not correct why another way worked in another type of question and this will only happen if you start early i mean you have worked into actual science you'll have to study for it so others will be like take a break of one month two months what is the point of starting so the results are not out so on that is one way to look at it works for some of you fine but for others who are serious i will say you will have to you know hopefully you want to clear all 13 exams i will say the sooner you get done with the better it's pretty challenging you know to study when you are working uh, it's difficult in that way and most of you not i will say most of you but some of you really struggle to do it they leave the papers then the easier way is you go for masters abroad you spend 40 lakh rupees for one year to get five six exemptions which you would have just spent over here i mean exams would have been one one and a half lakh that to reimburse by our company tuitions for higher papers as such are not there even if you take private coaching hypothetically you will pay five lakh rupees all very hypothetical conservative figures will end up clearing it it's just that people are not that disciplined you can't manage and suddenly if you feel one day you start working will be all disciplined will be studying every day it does not happen it needs to develop from today itself and if again that is not possible so try to clear as many papers as your circumstances allow by the time you graduate because later on you will thank yourself that yes you cleared paper you made your future life easier else if you want to make a present life easier do it it's as a trade off making your future life difficult so you start early you have time to do all these things think lot of with these things i used to start early i i used to enjoy it okay so i could start early some of you maybe don't enjoy studying this thing i understand i say take one two three weeks break i mean that is fine but then eventually you should get started simply because it will give you the time to explore the subject last one two months there is no time to explore and like for certain papers especially if you yourself are finding its preparation difficult you will not think about exploring your objective will be questioning over how to solve it how i am struggling how will i clear the paper how will i study for it your friends are being able to study progress with further chapters if you're taking classes maybe your teachers are going at a different speed or unable to be at par with them so lot of problems come so again solution for me to all that is you start early you have buffer time always so that anything happens somebody is getting married in our house you are getting married something else college exam you get dengue malaria like your in calcutta a lot of people are getting dengue in last i guess maybe 4 to 8 weeks or so so you keep buffer you prepare early and i'm telling you even if you don't do right now 3 4 years maybe one year maybe four years maybe 10 years somebody will come and tell me my other students who used to study in 2017 18 they come back and say bhai aap sahi bolte the wish we would have listened to you then it's very difficult not to manage everything together and it's not that ki i am correct others also you know who are there they know ki it's going to get difficult later on sometimes it's better to learn from others mistake than to commit it yourself i mean uh so yeah don't just wait for yourself to be in that difficult position uh so yeah this was question number 4 next question number 5 again this question on paper pretty much doable on what trust me i would have not even tried attempting it on exam i mean this was would have been the last question i would have attempted in exam because it did require a lot of stuff and i was doing it on paper i'm like uh, i just felt bad for all that i have to do it on word uh, there are one or two of you know again not uh, like not ticks but kind of poking you all uh, ones you know who didn't sit for exams in 2019 20 thinking covid is there online paper is there and you know then they are now sitting for cs2 in this online examination i do give an exam then pen and paper or like would have been easier so again do not defer anything whatever exam you want to give do sit for it ifo when they will change what they will change you will never know no, no need to don't try to even control them they also probably don't know what they are going to do they thought they will conduct obi exams in april 23 it won't be even conducted like it wasn't in april or september april 24 before so don't defer any of your papers with this logic it has been coming difficult easy format is changing blah 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 
you want to give exam, I'll give you 100 reasons to sit for it. You don't want to give, you yourself will give a reasons. I can also give you 100 reasons not to do anything. Ultimately, if you're serious, you want to become a qualified actuary, I will say clear as many papers as you can earlier. Again, not at the cost, you don't understand things. So don't take it this way. You know, sit for three papers, just mug up things, paper clear, karo. understand things. But yeah, if you can push yourself a little bit, you will make your life a bit difficult for yourself right now. But then it's going to be less difficult in future. So I will prefer that after five years, I'm in a better position compared to, you know, I'm fine to take the little bit of pain today itself. Again, it's all about balancing, but yeah. This is just because some of you know might take a clip of this video and say, Sir, take ask, you know, study, study, study so many papers, then we'll be chill. Life is not just about exams. All agreed, balance needs to be there. But uh, you all balance are like, you know, you will uh, not study eight months of the year, you will study four months. I mean, that thing is something that will not work later on. So, better to develop uh, that sort of things today itself. So question five, uh, not much to discuss. I just feel sorry for those who had to do this on Word. I saw this, I was solving part two. I'm like nightmare to do it on Word, honestly, because the time you do it, you type in the symbols, you try to interpret, you will be lost somewhere in between. So that is again, given we can't do anything. Uh, I, I will say for these things, you know, you could do it on paper. It might take more time, but if I think hypothetically I was sitting for this paper, I would have solved this question, like maybe the last in exam. And when I would be doing it, I would be doing it on paper. I realize if I do it first on paper, then I need to type it out. It's going to take more time. But then I don't see myself that I would have been able to you know, solve it accurately directly on board itself. So was this question doable even on paper part three specifically? Yes, like on paper, I did solve it. Like, so when you say paper, if you meant uh, during exam time on Word, some of them have solved it. Like one script I saw, uh, that student was able to solve it. I don't know whether he or she did it on Word uh, directly or did it on paper first, but yeah, on paper you could do. So I'll uh, take away for the solution of that. So XT is Y1, Y2, Y3, YT, so on which I can write it as XT minus 1 plus YT. Now YT is nothing but BET minus 1 plus ET. So this is the form I have left it in. XT is XT minus 1 plus BET minus 1 plus ET. I bring all XT terms on one inside, 1 minus B. So I see that P is 0, D is 1, Q is 1. Sadly, many, most of like, I saw maybe four or five scripts so far. Uh, leaving one script, all of you have got this uh, first one wrong. You just took P as one, seeing there is a term of XT minus one. Q as one or maybe something else. Part two, variance of YT. So this is nothing but, you know, substitute YT, which is ET plus BET minus one. So covariance of ET plus BET minus one, comma, ET plus BET minus one. These will be the terms. Covariance of ET, comma, ET minus 1 is 0 because error terms are independent. So this is coming out to be sigma square into 1 plus V square. Covariance YT, comma, YT minus 1. I again substitute YT and YT minus 1 in terms of error terms. All the other combinations of covariance terms will be 0 because they are of different time period. And we know that error terms of different time period are independent. So what we get is V sigma square. Next, what we have is XT is summation YI. So this can be written as summation of EI plus B E I minus one. So this is going to be E1 plus E2. So until ET, this first term, when I open the summation and this term is going to be B E, uh, uh, E1, E2, so on till, uh, ET minus one. And there's going to be B E zero as well, because when I is zero, E is going to be zero. So it's going to be E zero, E1, E2, so on till ET minus one. So now what you will see is. I will take the common terms of E1, E2 till ET minus 1. So E1 plus E2 so on till ET minus 1. There's a term over here. There's a term over here. So I take 1 plus T. What I'm going to be left with is ET, which is just over here, and E0 into B, which is just over here. So in this way, if I express, it makes my life a little bit easier going forward. Again, this took me a bit of time. Part 3 will see some, uh, you know, 
cuttings and also because I was trying to do it efficiently, he directly get it in the form they want it instead of having to manipulate it. So now variance of xt is 1 plus b square. Uh, this one, all are independent. We can use from the earlier part. This will be nothing but t minus 1 into sigma square. Not from an earlier part. I mean, I have uh, skipped a step over here. And then uh, et is also independent of this. So again, sigma square coming for variance et and then b naught. See, the reason why I have done in this way is all terms are independent of each other. So there will be no covariance terms coming from here. So solving this, I'm getting sigma square 1 plus b square into t into 2b t minus 1. Now, which I am expanding this entire bracket over here. Let me see if it's captured over here or not. It's not. So it's in the next page, I guess. So yeah, this was the variance part, I guess. This is what they had to show in variance. I have shown this t into 1 plus b square sigma square plus twice into t minus 1 b sigma square. So over here in the later part, once you open the brackets, you will get it in that form itself. So uh, yeah, this is the step over here. This is the step and here once you open the entire term, you can rewrite it in this particular format. Second part, covariance. So covariance of 1 plus b e1 e2 et minus 1 plus et plus b naught and then xt minus k. So in xt minus k instead of t you can write t minus k over here. So ignore the brackets over here. This is just going to be t minus k minus 1 only. Earlier I had done t minus of k minus 1 which was incorrect. So later on you will see there is cuttings. I made that changes. This will be e t minus k. This is going to be b e naught itself. So now I take this terms common you know till t minus k minus 1, these terms are going to be common, 1 plus the whole square, other terms are no common, we can remove it, their covariance will be 0, this term 1 plus b sigma square, uh, this corresponds to basically e, uh, the single term you get of, you know, this, uh, mm, this term will be of what, uh, I guess, e, uh, b not e, e square, p square is there, which I have written b square sigma square, I mean, this one single term will be coming from e t minus one, that one term which will be left behind. Uh, there will be one more common term as such. So we get this over here. We then this can be written as we take sigma square common and then I've taken common one plus b whole square t minus k minus one plus one plus b plus b square. And then you go about the usual manipulation in the next steps and uh, you will be getting in the required form. So again, keep in mind, I didn't do this in the first and it took a couple of plus minus and then also to bring it in the required format, you have to manipulate it in between. So I will say it is doable, definitely difficult, but doable at least from paper onward. I am to saying it would have been terrible to do it. Uh, so again, for these questions, it's like you do all the questions first, whatever remaining time you have you try to attempt these, at least the ones which you can solve. Some questions you can't solve even on paper, you leave it all together, but these questions will be a lot more easier if you try to solve on paper and then you could do it on board. Again, if you have time, if you not, um, nothing can be done much regarding that. So this question was there again, I will say five marks is something which could have, you could have got this six marks variance part you still would have, could have got, I mean, this also required some manipulation. So when you see here, I mean, try to see in the form of structure, like you see sigma square, this is nothing but, you know, variance of uh, the error term. You are seeing 1 plus b square into t means, you know, there should be t terms, each giving 1 plus b square contribution. Sometimes this helps. This comes through observation when you're solving it. One thing is you just solve, you know, but when you observe, it sometimes helps at the beginning, you know, how you should go about approaching the question. In which way do you want to express it? Because when I looked at these terms, I'm like, there is a particular way I need to arrange the term then. If I not, it's going to make my life complicated that way. I don't want to, I didn't want to find the recursive relations using you Walker equation and all. I mean, that would have made my life more difficult. I thought just put it in error terms, try to find the common ones to make my life easier. This comes through observations itself. It takes time. So again, something you all can try working on to develop this habit.
it will be helping you not just maybe in CS2 in case ones who sat for this term might have to sit for it again. But even for other papers as well. And even when you start working professionally in corporate work or even if you're doing your own thing, own business, any other thing, to think in this way you observe, it just uh, makes things better. Question number six, part two, easiest one of the paper, I will say definitely. I haven't seen anyone getting it wrong as such. Part one, absolute nonsense, the things which I saw. Normal approximation, we have put calculated, God knows why. And I understood these people have not read the material, not even gone through class notes. In class, we had covered, although, you know, we had just given the formula. There was no prior questions as such, but the formula was there. Sum of compound Poisson distribution. And there was this mention about PDF of it. Uh, sorry, CDF of it, MGF of it, for sum of compound Poisson distribution. And that is what exactly you have to apply in part one. It was straightforward. Just that you might not have seen any such question maybe, but you just had to apply the formula. The scripts which I saw so far, nobody had done it. And that was extremely disappointing because it's like, again, I tell you all to read the material to the extent possible. If you're running short on time, I will say, okay, maybe skip reading the material. So forget that. But ideally I say you should be targeting to read the material. Do not rely on what we do in class. Everything we might not be able to do. We might cover 95%, 99%. Some things will be there in material inherently. Even if from not from exam clearing point of view, at least for your own understanding learning purpose, you should be reading the material, active material. What I material give, what any other institute will give, those are all supplementary fine. None of this that I will say should mean that you will exclude reading the active material altogether. Ultimately, that is the core material, core reading book, and you should be going through that. Shortage of time, it's a different thing. Ideally, you should be going through it. Ones who didn't, ones who don't take proper notes while watching our classes, they simply skip this because there is no question like this in past year papers or in let's say material and questions as well. So it was natural for many of you all to you know, just uh, forget this topic altogether. So that was disappointing, I will say, because this was straightforward. So if I take one through the solution of it, S is equal to A plus B, A is like for the first set X1, X2, Xn, B is Y1, Y2, Yn. Xi follows normal 1500 comma 300 square, Y follows 1000 comma 200 square, N follows Poisson 20, M follows Poisson 50. We have sum of independent compound Poisson random variable, CDF of individual claim amount of S is this. If you remember lambda I by capital lambda, where capital lambda is nothing but summation of all lambdas into uh, CDF of the individual claim amount and then for the second one, one is X, one is Y. I'll show you through the material as well because some of you will say, no, sir, we too didn't see it's not there in material. Right now I have 2019 version. You see any version 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 will be coming. I don't think any one of you would have had 24 at time of your preparation as such. So over here, I'll show you in material where you can find this. Summary, you will find it in the material as well. Just we had to apply this formula. I mean, identification which compound poison should have been straightforward. You want to apply normal distribution, fine. It is of six marks. And if you can calculate exactly, you will calculate exactly. You will not calculate it using some approximation. Unless it was one, two marks, it's a different thing. This is the formula of the CDF. And that is what the question asked. I'll again take you back to the question. So read it again carefully. Determine the probability that combined cash withdrawal per customer, combined cash withdrawal per customer from both the cash machine is less than 1400 per customer. So what we're looking at is there are two types of uh, machines. One customer comes, that customer is going to take how much, be it from one cash machine made from two cash machines combined, total one customer is going to take how much? So we are looking at the individual CDF for the sum of compound Poisson process. Part B was mean standard deviation. 
it was fairly straightforward and again somehow to realize you all did part two first to apply normal approximation you need to find mean standard deviation you only calculated part two first and then you all applied in part one a lot of you did that so that should also have told you you know something might be weird for solving part one you need to solve part two first IFOE usually will give you questions which are structured they will not give you you know in part one you have to do something which could have been done from the results of the later parts as well so these are the small little nudges you can have as self checks. Again, not completely, you know, it will give you, but with a small self check, small nudges, which can give you hints. You know, you might be going wrong somewhere. There might be a different approach, and so on. If I was the examiner, I would not have given any marks for normal distribution in part one. Again, that would me being just very, uh, uh, I will say harsh on students, but take care, like. Uh, so if I was correcting the paper, I would maybe I would have given two marks out of six, not more than that. I, I, I would say rest how much uh, I have to give. We like to know once examiner reports are out. But I mean, uh, it, it is disappointing if we'll apply normal distribution. You should get an idea. You are deriving mean standard deviation in part two. Eight marks you're getting for that. Now just for applying normal approximation, you're going to get six marks. It's difficult. So again, there are questions like we did mark chain question in this paper. I was able to solve it in four lines. And that is why I'm still thinking, Ashmat, am I doing something wrong? That way, I could have been doing something wrong. So I don't know. Yet I feel it's correct, but it just felt like six marks for it. Thinking part only there. Here, not much thinking. This is basic calculation. So take a look at the solution again. We have sum of independent compounds. So this is my thing. 2 by 7 fx 1400 plus 5 by 7 fy 1400. I have not performed, I guess, uh, the calculation. You can do it. X follows a normal distribution. You need to find X is nothing but less than uh, 1400. And then similarly, you can find Y to be nothing but uh, less than 1400. So I have shown this as well. Probability Z less than minus 1 by 3. I guess I took the help of Excel to calculate this. In case of using tables to interpolate, you might get slightly different answer maybe in the third four decimal place. This is what I'm getting. A required probability I'm getting something around 80%. Now part 2, expectation S, variance S, computation is there. I'm getting expectation S as 80,000. The variance standard deviation S I'm getting as 9939.82. So this was the risk model question six. Moving forward to question seven. This again, I saw some of you couldn't do it. Those are exactly the ones you haven't solved faster questions. Similar question is there in revision notes where you know you are given ST. You need to, I have you know specifically solved this question. I mean the ones you have studied from us, they know specifically for this, you know how you need to make a guess estimate for NJ, DJ. And sometimes if you know fractions, it helps. Like let's say, you know, if it's 0. 0.555, if you know this is nothing but 5 by 9, 9, it makes your life easier. If you know what is 0. 0.375, it's 3 by 8, it makes your life easier to get DJ and J. If not, then you need to do trial error to the calculator. So this was that question. Should have been scored. Like most of you have even scored. One of them I saw didn't. And I'm pretty sure he or she didn't uh, go through revision notes properly. And I keep saying specifically for CS2, other papers also, but in CS2, the students experience this first time. You all don't listen to what I say. Bad things sometimes happen. I say, read whatever I'm saying in the class, take proper class notes, make note of anything I'm saying, go through solution discussion videos carefully. Even if you have solved it, go through it again, try to think about it because here it's gonna hit you. Other papers who get direct questions, tell that. This paper may it's not working that way. So uh, just don't solve questions for the sake of it. Use your brain when solving it. Eat properly, sleep properly, and then when you're studying, open your brain. Just don't do things mechanically. See what is happening, how questions are worded differently, why it was worded in this way. In another question, it was worded different way. Sometimes you get to understand from there itself. You end up spending a lot of time, obviously, but then that is, we won't give the input, we won't get the output now. We need to put some meaningful input that way. And only when you have tried these things, you'll know what are the intelligent, shorter ways of doing it. 
initially you need to try it hard and either we teach you we teach you a lot of things other people will be teaching you a lot of things your friends your colleagues you will learn something from them as well that is one part other things which are new you will need to learn it yourself so only when you try you know that okay, this is a better way this is not a better way you are not trying it all together just using whatever we are saying or others are saying you will never know you know if other methods are better or not and again you can try all these things if you have buffer of time maybe someday you want to say you know i ask for to study for 5 6 months if possible you might think no one month is sufficient maybe someday you try for a paper if it works for you well it works don't waste time that way i mean for the later papers i said it very less so uh, i don't talk about those because then my students will be like sir you only say to study early you yourself started two three months before exam i am doing two jobs honestly together i am teaching i am doing other job i have my interests in investments and well so i am into stock market that way so i get less time and then i knew the kind of uh, what to say i mean kind of articles finance articles i read i know lot of stuff so even if i study less from material the papers i selected i would be able to clear them the higher ones cp1 sp sc papers that won't be the case for most of you for some of you it might be relevant some of you even clear cp1 studying for two months and cp1 is like the biggest paper content wise some of them even struggle in three four attempts for different people different things work i studied cp1 i'm guilty of studying it for maybe two weeks that is it i didn't even read the entire material half of the chapters i just read summary some i didn't read all together again because i knew i know the stuff what i don't know i can google it out google gives me four points i can write 20 more points on basis of those four points and what is there in material i can search it in exam i can do it so i knew why i could use that method had i used that method for cncs papers it wouldn't have worked so different papers need different ways of studying higher papers some of you could study for maybe less time what you might be working might help you cm1 cm2 cs1 cs2 bad luck there is no other way than you know practicing it cs1 papers have been very easy so chalo forget that cs2 cm2 cm1 you cannot substitute time and practice and that is why you will see so many people you know uh, very similar to us then probably all exams left with let's say you know ct 4 6 8 according to old curriculum especially ct 6 ct 8 which new curriculum is equivalent to cs2 cm2 because once you start you don't get that much time ideally what i think uh, basis the way i used to prepare my batchmates used to prepare students used to prepare when you are doing numerical things you would want to sit at a time 2 3 4 hours at a stretch sometime maybe not 4 hours of studying sometimes you are doing something else but at a stretch you try to do when you are working 8 hours 9 hours 10 hours in a job staying in a different city managing your work traveling lot of other uh, responsibilities and life you can't sit for hours at a stretch you no know, one hour you said you see a video next day you go you will forget everything else so you need to put in the hours for these papers and so again a couple of you are in final year they were just saying you are going to defer cs2 or even cm2 for later on it's a difficult paper will need more time will give easier papers you are just making you are just increasing your chances of making your life difficult later on might not become difficult so i'm using chances so i will strongly suggest not to do that clear the difficult ones right now i mean because you have the luxury of time today you won't be having it later on so this was question 7 uh for the solution part i guess oh uh, yeah this should be telling again uh 1 10 2 9 1 5 1 3 and obviously we need to show the censoring part as well i have not shown that you could calculate in between how many lines are getting censored in between so that will also be there this was question 7 this was i would say the well performed one like 6 part 2 was pretty well performed 7 part 1 also no So relatively large proportion of you sh- is have expected to do well. You no know, one who didn't share this script, but they just mentioned they did attempted question seven and they look fairly uh, convinced. So they are starting with twelve lines. So two of them got censored between time two. One of you asking is why I am taking one by ten because I am getting one minus lambda j by nine by ten, and the only possibility this is, means lambda j is one by ten. There is just one. You start with twelve lines. You need ten percent exact. So ten percent can either be one by ten, two by twenty. It cannot be two by twenty because I'm starting with twelve. So it needs to be one by ten. So two people basically got censored before ten two. Okay. 
So moving forward to the last question. This one, some of you were able, you know, uh, able to comment well, part three, part uh, four as well. Uh, talking about gamma, exponential, variables, but uh, like one or two, I saw the answers. I was happy that you were able to you know, apply that somewhat to ignore theoretical stuff and these distributions. If you're working uh, in general in storage industry, I will say where these distributions are used, very few people have technical knowledge about these. I'll be very honest. People might be working for 10, 15 years, qualified actuaries. They don't know how to fit distribution or the very understand concept of distribution, how the structure is, how the underlying logic, you see a curve, you do not need to remember to gamma has this sort of shape. Point is if you see the shape of gamma or if you know how the parameter works, how you can fit to a particular scenario. So most of them don't know. So if you do it right now, you know it, you stand at an advantage later on because certain technical things, there will be very few people who can do it. And these are the ones who have their own terms when they're working in the organization, relatively basis. Not that whatever they are, they get, but they, because company also know he very few people can do a certain type of work. So for those type of work, they have better terms, be it anything. They want more work from home, maybe more money, more flexibility, more, uh, I will say authority to say no to work they do not want to do. They just want to focus on one type of work. So this is there, I mean, these things help ultimately, you know, these distributions, what you all did in CS1, that lays the foundation and then you need to keep up then later on. And once you have the industry business knowledge as well, how usually claims number distribution looks like for different industries, different type of policies, the shape will be different. Uh, claim size, what are the factors affecting it, the structure of the insurance policy, all these things. Again, these are for later papers once you start working, but your base needs to be set right now itself. So I look at the first part one and two of the solution of this part. Let M be excess of the assignment. X follows log normal mu comma sigma square. Expectation x variance x is given. These are the mu and sigma squares I have calculated. Uh, please let me know in case these are incorrect calculations. I'll check it again and I'll put in the rectification if needed. We need probability x greater than m to be 0 0.01. So I put this. So initially what I did was I did minus 2.3263. So I was getting a lower value. Then I later checked it's a greater than probability not less than. So it's coming out to be 4550. And part 2 probability x less than 1000. Uh, so yeah, we get this over here. So part two, it's coming out to be 0 0.054. So one of us talking about uh, part three, it has been proposed by the insurance regulator that such a basic pollution, blah, blah, blah. Comment on the appropriate using a normal distribution under various conditions. Okay. Part four, comment briefly on which of the following alternate distribution should be considered. So if you see gamma distribution, gamma has mode at zero. So gamma distribution looks something like this. Sorry, not gamma. Uh, I meant exponential distribution. Sorry. Uh, I mean, exponential distribution looks something like this. Gamma looks something like this, maybe. Okay. So, I mean, here, you know, mode is zero for exponential. For gamma, mode is nothing but alpha minus one by lambda. This is the mode. So, if we'll take a look at it. Uh, Exponential will not be good. Gamma seems to be fine, but uh, I haven't honestly seen part four. I mean, I might have to look at, you know, gamma variable as well. So usually in the industry for claim or uh, distributions, they tend to use log normal. Uh, they tend to use variable. They tend to use gamma as well. These three are the usually used ones for uh, claim amounts. So over here again, uh, variable, uh, has a different sort of parameter it usually has you know thicker scales for certain values of gamma and it's more flexible uh, with respect to shape as compared to gamma exponential is obviously not good so here you could use let's say gamma or variable and again here it's not written that uh, should be considered so we could consider actually over here gamma and variable and then you could talk about its uh, advantages and how you go about fitting it so you can do a 
goodness of pit test or likelihood whatever and you have these data you can compute through maximum likelihood estimation or you can make intervals you can put in data and then whether you can first estimate the parameters and then you need to perform goodness of pit test this is something which we, we did in cs1 itself so you need to talk about that do not do not need to perform it you need to talk about that okay, how we can go about uh you know describing the final model you need to obviously ultimately perform a goodness of pit test as well Uh, in question part number two, okay, calculate the number of claims that would be expected to be less than 1000. Yes, so there are 10,000 of these claims. So I'm going to multiply 10,000 with this probability 0 0.054, and this is going to be what 54, I guess. 10,000, uh, one, two, three. Yes, it is. Yeah, this is 54 by 1000, 10,000. It's going to be what? 5 foot? Uh, what is that? Wait, 0 0.054. Is, is this a percentage or not? It's just 0 0.054. You multiply it. Yeah, it's coming out to be what? 54 itself, I guess. Or 540. Something like that, I guess. You can check the mathematics later. But yeah, I will multiply basically 10,000 with 0 0.054. Uh, because it's asking the number of things. So overall, this was the discussion. Uh, I will say maybe the half of the session was academic stuff. Half of the session was not directly academic, but those were the things honestly I wanted to discuss on. So that anyone who has to sit for CS2 again in future, I can just say, please go and watch this video, listen to what I say, apply it. It's gonna help you later on itself. So yeah, this was this. Now coming to what pass marks. Let's see somewhere between 52 to 256 is what I think. Like 54 plus minus 2. If anyone is getting a 56 plus or so in paper EB as per their uh, estimate. I mean, hopefully you would be clearing the paper. Plan your papers accordingly. Someone is scoring less than 50 for sure. I will see you can discount that or not here in CS2. You can decide for your course of action accordingly. And the ones who are in between this, you know, 50 to 56 or so, I mean, you might clear, you might not clear. You start with your preparation. The results will be out if I correctly remember 5th of December. So it's usually Tuesday and Thursday. Tuesday is for the initial set of six papers. Thursday is for the other set of papers. So I guess it's 5th of December this time. Uh, results are going to be out. So again, you need to... I mean, once we are starting from us, they can touch base us again on 5th December or 6th December, this is the results. And then again, when examination booking opens in February, that is the final concrete call to take, you know, uh, to book your exams. This is the kind of preparation you have. So hope that this session was helpful to all of you. Once who would be looking at this video later on in our YouTube channel. If you find this video useful, please do like it. And if you have any suggestions or anything else you want to Discuss about, I mean, the ones who are not our students, you can do it through the comment section. Ones who are studying from us, who have direct access to me and Nunjan, so yeah, you can directly reach out to us in our class or through WhatsApp itself. So that is all I have today. Thanks everyone for taking out time and getting this session. Thank you.